Okay, so the main topic for the day is uh, read Solomon Code. Okay, so we've seen uh, most of the definitions already. It's not a, it's not going to be a new definition for you. So let me make it uh, once again. So we'll we'll start uh, we'll start with n being a block length. Okay. And we'll pick once again an element beta and some g of two per m such so that order of beta is greater than or equal to m. Okay, so we'll do that. Okay, and then next we'll define a parity check matrix. Okay, suppose the design error correcting capability. Let's say T, then you have to have one beta beta squared all the way to beta star minus one, one beta squared beta square squared all the way to beta squared star minus one, and down to beta power two T, beta power two T squared all the way to beta power two T star minus one. So far, I've not departed much from the BCH codes. Seems like it's the exact same thing. But the Reed Solomon code here, RS code, the T error correcting RS code of length n is basically set of all C. Here's the big change. The big change is that you won't expect your code words to come from G of two. You allow your code words to come from G of two per m. Okay, such that H times C transpose is. Okay, so the big change is in that is in this here. Okay, instead of G of two here, I put G of two per m. Okay, so this simplifies a lot of the a lot of a lot of the computations. It also adds to a lot of the computations. I'll show you how it works. Is that okay? So that's the first. Uh, Is there already any questions? Is it okay? Okay, so I have a parity check matrix from G F two per m, and I have the code also from G F two per m. So everything is very easy to do now. It's not it's not very hard. Okay, so the block length is n, and to find the dimension, all I have to do is find the rank of H, and the rank of H will be equal to n minus k. Okay, and it turns out the rank of H in this form is in fact equal to two t. Okay, so one can show rank of H is equal to two t. Okay. There are various ways of showing it. In fact, I'll, I'll I'll determine the dimension directly for you. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to find the rank first and then find the dimension. I'll find the dimension directly, and then from there we can go to the rank. Okay, that also we can. So how do you find the dimension directly? Okay, so for that what you do is you look at this H C transpose equal to zero. Okay, and then look at the first row. What does the first row tell me? It says, right? So if you think of the code word C as C0, C1, C2, all the way to Cn minus one, remember each C is from what? So G of two par. Okay, so it's not G of two. I can now write a code word polynomial which is C0 plus C1x plus so on to Cn minus one x par n minus one, and each coefficient is from G of two par. Okay. Now the first row says. C zero plus C one beta plus C two beta square so on till C n minus one beta per n minus one equals zero, which is the same as saying C of beta equals zero. Okay. I have a polynomial with coefficients from G of two per m, and it has a root beta n G of two per m. Okay, so that implies what? Okay, C of x should have some factor. What should be a factor of C of C of x? C x plus beta divides C of x. Okay, it should be actually minus beta. Where did I put plus beta here? This characteristic is two, so it doesn't matter whether it's minus or plus. Actually, I should put minus. Minus is the same as plus. Now, likewise, I can do for the second row. What I put for the second row? C of beta square is zero, which implies x plus beta square 
comes from the right CFS. So like when you go all the way to the peak row, it says C of beta part two B equals zero, which equals x plus beta part two B divides C of x. Okay, so you put all these things together, what can I say? The LCM of x plus beta, x plus beta squared, so on till x plus beta part two B has to divide C of x. Okay, what is the LCM of all these things? The product because all of them are irreducible degree one guys. So from there you see that implies okay x plus beta times x plus beta squared all the way to x plus beta power two t has to divide c of x. In fact, every step that we did is reversible. Okay, so you can go back, you can go back here, you can go back here, you can go back here, you can go back. Okay, so h c transpose is zero if and only if this polynomial, which I will call as g of x, divides c of x. Okay, so this is the this is the g of x, which is called generator polynomial. So there it's all about. Is that clear? So the problem in BCH codes was we could just not say this. Okay, so all these things are true for BCH codes, but then this doesn't quite solve the problem because the polynomial on this side is, is actually class coefficients from gf2 par n and you, and you don't want that, you want binary code words. Okay, so that's so we needed to go to minimal polynomials and all that. For each Solomon codes we have no such problems. If we are happy with code words from gf2 par n. Okay, so this will be good enough. Okay, so you have a polynomial. So another description for the same read Solomon code that we had before is basically so of our c of x equals m of x times g of x, the g of x that we had before Okay, so that m of x has degree. What? What is the degree of g of x? First of all, degree equals two t, right? Right. I want multiples of this g of x, and the c of x degree should be less than or equal to n minus one. So, what is the maximum degree of m of x that I can go to? N minus two t minus one. Okay, so m k minus one x power k minus one and k equals n minus two. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so that gives you the dimension. So you see that the Z Solomon code has dimension equals n minus two t, and from this you can go to the rank of H which will be 2 T exactly. Is that okay? The next question is minimum distance. What about minimum distance? Okay. So I'm going to say minimum distance equals 2 T plus 1. Okay. So the proof is basically two things I have to show. I have to show that the minimum distance cannot be less than or equal to 2 T. How do I show that? You use the same proof as you did before with line bound matrices. Suppose you have a weight W code word that W is less than or equal to 2T. Okay, you fix the locations of those W things, I1 through IW, pick the corresponding columns, you know that that column has to have less than W column rank. But then you can take W rows of that column on the W columns and create a line bound matrix out of it which will have full rank and that will be a contradiction. So W less than or equal to 2T is not possible. Okay, we don't worry about binary code words. We only worry about rank there, right? So it's the same thing. Okay, so it cannot be less than or equal to 2t. How do I know it will be equal to 2t plus one? How do I know that there will be a 2t plus one weight code word? Here? Sorry. Yeah, exactly. See, now my code words are from GF2 par n, so I can simply use linear algebra, simpleton, do whatever I want. I don't have to worry about the binary factor, right? So you take 2t plus 1, any 2t plus 1 columns of this Pyrdeshek matrix. The rank has to be only 2t, which means they are linearly dependent. So there will be a code word supported on any 2t plus 1 columns. Okay. In fact, that makes this code very, very special. Okay. Dimension is k equals n minus 2t. Minimum distance 2t plus 1 is n minus k plus 1. Okay, so what does that mean? RS codes are 
maximum distance separable in the sense that they satisfy the single temple. Okay, so that implies R S codes have parameters n k b equals 1 minus k plus 1 and that makes them maximum distance separable codes they satisfy the single temple. Okay. So they are very good codes in some sense. Okay, over G of 2 par m, they are very good codes. Okay. So a couple of other questions and thing, things I want to point out. Dimension is k. So in the binary case, how many code words would have been if dimension is k? Would have been there, that would have been 2 par k. Okay, but remember this is not binary. Okay, the number of symbols each coordinate is 2 par m. Okay, so the number of code words will be 2 par m k. It is not just 2 power k. Is that okay? So it's a it's a different uh, thing here. Suddenly you, it, it, everything is being raised to the power m. Okay. So this parameter will actually be m. Then k will be remember k will be this. So 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 let me write that down. When I say block length is n, it is n elements of elements of what? G of two power m. Okay. So that's a different thing. So when I say k, it's once again k elements of G of 2 power m. Okay, what is the notion of minimum distance again? What is the distance between two vectors in G of 2 power m? Number of places in which they differ. It's the same. So when I say minimum weight, it is number of non-zero positions. Okay, those things remain the same as before. Number of so you can't say number of places in which it is one often for minimum weight for weight, right? You say number of non-zero elements. So you know, anything non-zero is is a weight form. Okay, that's how it's a weight form. All right. So this is how a general reed Solomon code, code looks and a lot of detail is, is given here. For instance, you can encode very easily. How do we encode? You take your message and then multiply by the generator matrix. Okay, so you might wonder that this is not a systematic encoder, but how will I get a systematic encoder? You do the x bar n minus k multiplication and divide by gfx. Take the reminder and append it in the beginning, you will get a systematic encoder. So you can get a very sim simple systematic encoder for it. Okay? But the only confusion here is what do you do with elements of g of 2 par m? Okay, so how do you get to them? I think ultimately you will only have bits in real life, right? It's going to be bits. How do you go from bits to elements of g of 2 par m? Do the encoding. After you encode, you have to transmit it using a regular digital communication kind of system which will also again expect bits. So how do you go from bits to symbols of g of 2 par m? And how do you go from symbols of g of 2 par m back to bits? Okay. Those are the two things which is slightly missing here. So I am going to draw a block diagram. To illustrate how this will work. So, if you have an NK Creed Solomon code, how the whole block diagram will look will be as follows. Okay. So, you will start with first m times k bits. This will be your original message. The binary message vector will be m times k bits. So, what will I do? I will do some kind of a conversion to Okay, so I will, I will convert to, to G of 2 par m. Okay, and I will get a message vector from 0, m1, mk minus 1, and each mi belongs to G of 2 par m. Okay, in a way, if you think about it, this is just a reorganizing of the km vectors. Instead of thinking of them as mk bits, I am going to put them in k rows, each row having m bits and each row instead of thinking of them as m bits, I am going to think of them as elements of gf2 par m. Okay? What is the difference between just a vector of m bits and thinking of it as elements over gf2 par m? What is additional when you think of it as gf2 par m? You can multiply two eight m bit vectors. Okay? So, if you just think of them as m bits, only thing you will do is maybe add, you will XR them together coordinate wise, you would not know how to multiply them. When I think of two m bit vectors as elements of gf2 par m, I can also multiply them and get what? Get another m bit vector as answer. Okay, so that's what the added notion of GF2 bar m means. Okay, so once you get this message vector, you can also think of it as a polynomial one of x. Okay, what do you do? You do encoding. So you encode with g of x. If you like, you can do systematic. Otherwise, you do non-systematic, and you get a code. Okay, c of x, and then this would be c0, c1, all the way to cn minus one. Okay, once again remember this will be how many bits? Okay, I have to convert this into bits. So I convert to bits again. 
and I'll get how many bits? n times m bits. Okay, so maybe I should write n times n. Okay, this is the final code word that got in binary. Alright, is this clear? This is how the encoder will operate. Okay, so if you pick, if you pick for instance k to be, so for instance for example, if you pick, so very common choice for m is a. Okay, so that you are doing operations over g of 256. Why do you think they like a? Because a bits is a is a byte, and people like to think of it as bytes. In a computer, for instance, a lot of things are stored as bytes. So it's easy to count in bytes. Okay, so k, for instance, you might pick to be 239. Okay, so this is a very common. Okay, situation and you might take n to be 255. Okay, this is a very very common code. Okay, so how many bits do you need here so you can encode? 8 times 239. How much is that? Let me see. It should be something in the 265. Right? <laughs> Do the multiplication. So it's already nine into eight. What is that? One nine. Nine one two. So one nine one two. Okay. So something like it will be in the two thousand range. It cannot go to the sixty-two thousand range and all. Okay. Don't get carried away. Okay. So here you would have m times k to be equal to one nine one two. Is that okay? Right. So what will be m times n? Two zero four zero. Okay, so that's uh, that that many bits you have. So internally, you'll be thinking of this m times k bits as actually 239 elements of GF2 par m, and you have to think GF GF256. You have to think that way because the encoding involves a multiplication. So you have to multiply two 8-bit vectors together to get an 8-bit vector out. You will have some circuitry for it and all that, and it involves multiplication like that. So you have to think of it internally as 239 bytes. And these bytes come from GF2256. They also have multiplication capability. Okay? But to the outside world, you actually have a 1912 bit input and 2040 bit output. Okay? So that is the other uh, point here which you should keep in mind. Alright? Okay? So this is the overall code. Alright. So now, uh, there are some subtle points here about minimum distance, binary, what, is, what does it mean for the overall binary thing etc. We will come back to it later on. But for now, we will for the next few lectures, we are going to forget about this binary to GF2 par m and GF2 par m back to binary. It can always be done. We know that it always can be done. So, we will simply treat everything as elements of GF2 par m and we will do encoding and decoding at that level. And finally, I will come back and comment on what happens in the binary. Okay? So, let us just accept this, uh, this kind of operation. And move on to uh, more interesting properties. Okay, so so there are a lot of properties for each element codes. A lot of things are known about these MDS codes in general and each element codes in particular. So we won't go into all that detail here. I'm going to quickly jump to the decoding part. The only thing I emphasized was the MDS part, and then also the fact that GFX is a generated polynomial. So let me point out some connection to the cyclic property. Okay, so if you pick n to be equal to order of theta. Why this will make the code RF codes uh, RF code will be cyclic. Okay, the same proof as before goes through. There is nothing that you have to change. Okay, so if n becomes equal to order of beta, the RF code becomes cyclic. So you rotate cyclically rotate the code word, you get another code word. There's no problem. Okay, so so as far as cyclic codes are concerned, we saw only binary cyclic codes. We never saw non-binary cyclic codes. It turns out we can also define non-binary cyclic codes pretty much in the same fashion as I did before. Okay, I had F2x and then I had R2 which was F2x modulo x par n plus 1. You do the same thing with instead of F2, you put F2 par n. Okay, you will get the exact same formulation and you can show that these RS codes are in fact ideals in R2 par n instead of R2. Okay, so all those things will go through and this generator polynomial that we had is actually the generator for that ideal inside R2 par m. Also it can be shown. Okay, so all those things are true and we are not going to do that. Okay? We are not going to do that here. We will just stick to that. Okay? So what is of most interest is decoding. As you can see encoding seems like you can do it very easily. If you go through the channel there is no problem. You will receive on the other side. How do you decode? That is the problem. Okay? So once again if you want to do ideal ML decoding 
it's going to be impossible. Okay, so if you have to write the syndrome decoder with all possible syndromes, you won't you won't get anywhere. So what is the simplification that we'll do? Bounded distance decoding. Okay, so we'll say we'll give up on ideal full fledged decoding, ML decoding. We'll simply take a bounded distance decoder. So what does the bounded distance decoder do? If there are less than or equal to T errors in the channel, I will try to correct it. If there is greater than T errors, I will give up. Okay, I won't even try to correct. Okay, that's the idea in the bounded distance decoder. Okay. So let's talk about these bounded distance decoders. Okay, they are also algebraic and they are also very similar to the BCH code except that you have this GF2 param and you'll see what I mean by that when I describe the decoder. Okay. So let's let's look at the picture again. I have a message problem on my line of X. It's getting encoded by TRS. When I put TRS, what do I mean? Okay. Okay, a T error correcting BCH code and let's say this M M I is of some C F2 par M. Okay. And this is uh, T error correcting each element code over G F2 par M. Okay. And this is going to produce a code word C of X. Okay, once again C R R from G F2 par M. Okay. And this is going to work through a channel, and the channel I'm going to model as similar to before. I will have an error vector, error polynomial EFX and where will the EIs come from? GF2 par M. Okay. Is this a reasonable model? Can I say that the error vector or the error polynomial has coordinates from GF2 par M? Yeah, exactly. So, it is same as the binary situation. right? So, I am going to, I would have actually converted the CFX into n times m bits and it would have gone through a binary symmetric channel. right? So, binary error vector would have been added. I can just group m of those bits together and I can think of the error vector as actually a being from GF2 par m. It is only adding, it is not multiplying. So, really there is no real big change here. It is only adding and it is consistent with the addition in GF2 par m. Okay. So, I can think of VFX also as coming from GF2 par m. Okay. But there is a complication here. You have to think about the error model a little bit more closely. Can I, yes, sir, sir. Yeah, it will be different. So the error model is very different. Okay, so so I'm going to talk about that right now. Okay, so there is this EI being in GF2 par M. Okay, but remember, underlying all this is a binary symmetric kind of channel which has n times m bits going through and n times m bit error vector being added. I just group it together and think of each error vector coming from uh, GF2 par M. Okay, so now what do I mean by saying T errors? Okay, what do I mean by saying W errors? W errors means what? means what? It means weight of this guy E0, E1, E n minus 1 is less is equal to W. Okay, so if I say W error has actually occurred, it means weight is equal to W. Okay. What is weight of a see remember each of these EIs are from G of 2 power n. So what do I mean by saying weight is W? Number of non zero coordinates when I view them as elements of GF2 par m equals W. Okay. Does it mean that actually the number of errors, binary errors that they introduce, is it equal to W? No. What is to the, what should be the lowest number of binary errors that are introduced by the channel to give me this W? It should be W, right? You need at least W binary errors. When you think of it, when you expand it and think of it as n times m bits. Only if at least W binary errors occur, there can be W. But there can be a maximum of M times W, right? Even we can, there can be M times W binary errors resulting only in W errors in GF2 param. Okay, so that's a bit of a complication in the error model that you have to watch out for. Okay, so in the binary case, when I had N bits going through the channel, if I have a big W error vector, what's the probability of the error vector? It's P par W. 1 minus p per n minus w. In the in the GF2 per n case, if I say I have a weight w error vector, what is the probability of, the, of that particular error vector? I cannot say anything because I am not giving you enough information. It can be as high as p per w times 1 minus p per n m minus w, it can be as high as that or it can be as low as p per n w, m w times 1 minus p power n minus n m minus m w ok 
okay it can be it can range over a wide or range of possibilities so you can average it out and give you a number that is that it's not fixed okay so if i say a weight w or a vector probability in a bsc model is not that fixed but anyway it's it's relevant to us because anyway we are doing bounded distance decoding okay so finally we'll com com compute some probabilities and you'll see it matters a little bit but we're doing bounded distance decoding we don't have to really worry too much about these things we'll just assume some w errors occur and this w is less than or equal to c okay so this so so remember this subtlety again there is an underlying binary symmetric channel which inter introduces bit borders okay then there is an abstracted gs2 par m channel which introduces errors in every element okay so suppose i say so let, let me do one more computation okay so what is the probability that let's say e0 is not equal to 0 1 minus 1 minus p power m the clear okay so if you think of in terms of is it okay it's fine right so if you think in terms of gf2 power m channel what's the probability that a particular coordinate of the error vector is non zero it is 1 minus 1 minus p power m right and this is this is what this is the probability for e0 what would be the probability for e1 again the same thing but is the e0 in e1 independent they still be independent they come from the front desk so now if i ask you the question what's the probability of w errors in this how do you answer that question you can do m choose w times this guy power w then 1 minus this guy power and minus one. that you can do that is like the averaging out of the w error so it's a stop so you can do that and get an answer so this you can call as something like ps which is the probability of symbol error okay so you can call it the probability of symbol error okay and i want to distinguish between ps and p p is the probability of each bit being an error ps is the probability that the symbol is an error and there's a complicated relationship between the two but if p becomes really 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 small what will be the dominant term mp so that is going to be the dominant term so it can be useful in some approximations if you want to get a quick handle on what's happening m times p is a good approximation for ps okay and remember all your this this case for instance you want to find the probability that weight of e0 3 and minus 1 equals w what will be the probability of that you have to put m choose w then what ps power w 1 minus ps power n minus w is so correct okay is this correct is this okay why am i worried about this 1 minus ps i think it's okay all right so you will get something like this in your uh, in your answer and you have to, to watch out for this a little bit in your computations it's not as simple as the binary case little bit more complicated not too much complicated. okay so after all this spiel about the error vector finally you get a received polynomial where each ra is from g of 2 power m and this is the model we use okay so now once i assume w errors in efx okay what will be the form of efx W errors. Okay, so E of X can be taken in this form. So you can take X power I one plus X power I two plus so on to X power I W. But is that enough? No, I have to put coefficients. Okay, so that is the big complication. So I have to take capital E one here, capital E two here, capital E W here, and each of these E's will come from G of two power M. Okay. In the BCH case, when we were doing bounded distance decoding, we were only interested in finding I1, I2 through IW. Once I find that, I'm done. Right? I just go to those corresponding locations and flip the bits. When I say a bit is an error, there's only one thing that can happen. But when I say a symbol is an error, it can happen in two power m minus one different ways. Okay? So many different things can add to it, and so many different things can happen. Okay? So I not only do I have to find I1 through IW, I should also find E1 through IW. Okay, so the decoding task is to find I1 through IW 
find D13. Of course, there's, there's the same problem of not knowing W that we had before, but like I said, we will tackle it later. There's this ways of iteratively solving it so that the W problem gets taken care of, taken care of automatically. Okay. So we have to find both I1 through IW and E1 through IW. That's the idea. Okay. So other than this complication, the method is very similar to the method we had for the BCH code. So what is the first step that you can do? You compute the syndrome. Okay. So you give an RFX, you compute the syndrome. And the syndrome is basically evaluating RFX at beta, beta square all the way to beta part 2t. Okay, so let's do that. First step is syndrome. I will compute S1 equals R of beta. But what will be R of beta? C of beta plus E of beta. And what is C of beta? 0. So it's the same as E of beta. And what is E of beta? E1 beta power I1 plus E2 beta power I2 all the way to W beta power I2. What is S2? Do I have to compute S2 explicitly? Or can I simply say S2 is S1 squared? No, okay, so be very careful, okay. So if the coefficients are binary, if this E1, E2, EW are binary, then of course S2 will be the same as S1 squared. But now I have two coefficients which are from G of 2 power n. So when I square it, what will happen? I will get E1 squared, okay, and E1 squared is not the same as E1. Okay, so you get a different polynomial, so different expression, and S2 is not dependent on S1. Okay, so it's definitely a different syndrome, and it's it's a very very valid row, and you, you have to evaluate it. Okay, so this will be E1 power beta power 2i1 plus E2 times I'm sorry E1 E1 times beta power 2i1, E2 times beta power 2i2, all the way to E w times beta power 2i2. So you do this all the way down to the last syndrome, which is S2t, or evaluated at beta power 2t, e1 power beta power 2t, i1, so on to w beta power 2t, okay? And all these the 2t syndromes have to be evaluated, okay? Having said that, I should also point out a simplification here, okay? So as soon as R of X comes in, you don't have to necessarily try to evaluate R of X at beta, beta square, etc. You can have a division circuit for dividing with X plus beta, X plus beta square, X plus beta power 3, X plus beta power 4. It's roughly the same as before, but except that division is a well understood thing uh, from a VLSI point of view. But remember, when we divide in G of 2 power M, so everything will be 8 bits okay, or M bits in general. Okay, so it will not be just binary. Okay, so it's a bit more complicated. But you can divide. Once you divide, the remainder you get is equal to R of beta. Am I right? Right? If you divide R of x by x plus beta, the remainder you get is equal to R of beta. Okay, think about it. Okay, so it's very easy to see that. So that's the idea. Okay. So this is the first step. So we know the syndrome, and this is very similar to what we had before. So the steps are also exactly the same. The first step is to define something called error locator. What is the error locator? X j is beta power i k with j equals 1 to 1. Okay. And these EIs are actually called error values. Okay. So they call error values. Okay. So once you do this, the equations you get will look like power sum. So more quickly write it. E1 x1 plus E2 x2. W x W S two is E one x two square E two x two square E W x W square all the way down X two T which is E one x one bar two T plus E two x two bar two T So that is your set of equations, okay? And you have a bunch of power sum equations with uh, left hand side is known to you, okay? Remember this part is known. Okay? What is not known is X1 and E. 
okay, you don't know the x, you don't know the e. Okay, so this was a bit different from what we had in the BCH case. But the method that we use is very, very similar. Okay, so what is the method that we use? We did a transformation, right? What is the transformation? Remember the transformation we did in the BCH decoder? We defined something. What did we define? Some sigma of x. What is that sigma of x? Okay, it was called a zero locator polynomial. Okay, so how did I define that? What was the definition for sigma of x? Yeah, 1 plus x1 x times 1 plus x2 x so on to 1 plus xw x is that okay? Right? So this is the syndrome, the error locator polynomial and I argued for how if you think of the sigma as simply 1 plus sigma 1 x plus so on to sigma w x bar w, you are actually doing a, you are basically setting sigma 1 and sigma w be the symmetric polynomials in x1 and x, x w, the relationship between the roots and the coefficients of the polynomials with those roots. Okay, so that is what we are writing here. But what is the next step after this? We did an S of x and then we multiplied S of x by sigma of x and observed that from x bar w plus 1 to x bar 2 t there will be zeros. Okay, and that same observation can be made here also. With these E1s and E2s and EWs, it does not affect anything. Remember, the column was what mattered, right? We had S1, X, S2, X square, so on till S2, T, X per 2, T. And the column E1 factors out of the first column. Okay, you multiply 1, 1 plus X1, X there, everything will go away. You will only have W, you will never have W plus 1 all the way to X per 2. Okay, so the same argument as before can be used in the multiplication. And you can show that if you define f of x to be s1 x of s2 x bar so on to s2 t x bar 2 t okay and if you do the product s of x times sigma of x coefficients of x bar w plus 1 all the way to x bar 2 t are 0 okay so the same method as before I, I did it a bit laboriously last time I am going to just skip it this time you write it and then multiply column wise. Okay, look at the first column, multiply 1 plus x1 x, everything will cancel, you will not have anything, but then you have w minus 1 terms following, so those can, those can come in. The only thing you can have at 2 is w. From w plus 1 to 2t, you won't have anything. Now, for the next column, what do you do? You multiply 1 plus x2 x first, and then you do the same argument, you will get it. Okay, so, so I am going to kind of stop the decoder here because after this, the method is exactly the same as before. Okay. So, if you look at the equations from x bar w plus 1 to x bar 2 w, you will get a proper invertible matrix and if that matrix is full ranked, you can find sigma 1 through sigma w. Okay. So, you use these equations to find, so use these equations to find sigma 1, sigma 2 and the way of sigma w. Okay. So, of course, you do not know w. So, what is the trick there? You have to start with t and then go to t minus 1, t minus 2, etc. till you get a full rank matrix. Okay, so, whenever you get a full rank matrix, you can invert it and you can find sigma 1 through sigma w. Okay, so, of course, we are not done here. What should we do next? Find roots of sigma of x. Okay. okay. <coughs> I will come to the EIs. I will come to it later soon enough. Okay. Find roots of sigma of x. Okay, so, this is a crucial step. There is a condition here. When you find roots of sigma of x in GF2 param, what is the condition? Something has to happen for you to declare success. What has to happen? When you find roots of sigma of x in GF2 par m, what should you get? You should get W distinct roots. Okay, so that is very crucial. If you do not get W distinct roots, something went wrong. Your bounded distance assumption failed okay, in some way. Okay? So if there are W distinct roots, okay, so you can put like an algorithmic question here and say w distinct roots question mark okay no means what declare failure s means xj is basically 
inverse of the root. Okay, so you take the inverse of the root, set it to be equal to xj. Okay, so that's the way to find xj. Once you find xj, how will I find the ej? See, once the xj is unknown, what do these equations become? Linear equations in the E's. Okay, so you take the first w rows. Okay, and I have to argue that it give me give me a linearly independent set of equations, and that will be linearly independent. Again, you can use random one. Okay, so you look at the equation x1 to x w are distinct. You see, it's a random one matrix. So you do w by w, it will be invertible. So you use the first w equations to a linear equation solution. You can find the error okay, finding the uh, error locations is quite easy. Once you, well, finding the error values is easy. Once you find the error locations, okay, so once you know the error locations, you can find the uh, error values. So okay. So so I'm going to leave it at that, and then after that, the last step is use syndrome equations. Use W syndrome equations. Okay, so they are now linear. To find. So, for the Reed-Solomon decoder, in principle, the methods are very similar to the BCH decoder. There is nothing really that is different. The only thing is the error value and that can be found ultimately by some simple linear inverse. Okay, so, I am going to draw a block diagram here to illustrate what happens here. So, you have RFX. First step is to find R of theta to R i. So, you find the syndrome. The next step is find sigma of x. Okay, so we do that. That's that's a bit of a tricky step. You have to do some solution, and this is the most complicated step. So once you find the sigma of x, you find roots of sigma of x. Here you can go to failure. Once you find the roots of sigma of x, find. Okay, so once you find easier, what should you do? You should go back here, and then this gives you. Remember, this gives you e cap of x. So come here, then add it to this guy. You get sigma. Okay, and assuming we did systematic encoding, simply take the first k elements of c of x. That will be your message. Is that okay? So finding the syndrome, like I said, is not really a complicated step. You can do it in so many ways. There are methods for it. Finding sigma of x is the crucial complicated step. And I think some of the project students are going to be doing some methods for this. There's, there's various methods. One is the telecom Massey method, which extends to the Reed-Solomon code also. You can do it for BCH codes. Extends for the Reed-Solomon code. There's something called the Euclidean domain decoder for it, and then something called frequency frequency domain decoder for it. All kinds of methods are there for finding the sigma. After that, finding roots of sigma of x. How do you do that? What is the method for finding roots of sigma of x? Trial and error, right? So you have to just try one after the other. So there's a more fancy method which is called GM search. People will talk about, but basically it's it's trial and error. So you have to try one after the other and find the roots. And then once you find the roots, uh, finding E J need not involve a linear equation solving and all. So in fact, finding sigma of x also nobody will do the method that I described. Okay, there are more fancy iterative methods. Will nicely give you the solution, and likewise, once you find these guys, finding E J, there's something called Fourier algorithm. Okay, which is what I've actually used. Okay, so nobody uses some linear equation solving. In it. Okay, so it's some simple uh, substitution method. It's not very hard. So if you think about it, you can also do it. So it's a method that's used for uh, finding E J. Okay, so at the end of the day, you can find the error vector. And you can find the C cap of x. Of course, there is also a probability that you will fail. Okay, whenever the number of errors is greater than the uh, t, the error correcting capability, you will also fail. Okay, so if it is less than or equal to t, you will never you will never fail. You'll exactly correct. Is that okay? All right. So that's the Reed-Solomon code. I mean, you it's uh, it's it's in fact I should tell you that it's a very very celebrated code. It's one of the most widely deployed codes ever. Okay, 
okay and uh, at this stage in our course we are able to finish it off in one lecture but of course it required a lot of preparation before we could come to this point okay and all the ideas we've seen before the idea that was in this lecture we've seen before it's just a recasting in the gf2 param framework that's the only thing we had to do but like i said it's a very very celebrated code it's there in it's there in every single hard drive okay it's all in code is used in every single hard drive right pod whatever i mean any hard drive you have in any device it will have a it's all in code it's used in uh, optical communications for instance there are these cables that run under the oceans under the pacific ocean under the atlantic ocean and all the carrying carrying all your internet data from one one continent to the other okay so they have huge it's all in code chips sitting there on both sides okay so you have the the wobble sys it's all in code used in okay those are the two big big applications but there are also several other problems that people routinely use with solving codes okay, so and in fact in computer science and some cs theory algorithms it's used in so many places with solving codes are used. it's a very 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 famous code and it's it, for, for long it was considered as one of the great achievements of uh, coding okay. it's a very simple code there are so many other descriptions this one itself is uh, is very nice okay so so maybe we'll we'll start here for this lecture and let you digest this uh, this for a while and like i said the project people doing the projects are doing some implementation of this decode okay so they will maybe when they present you will see some more ideas on how this is done okay so in the next class i'm going to go back to the binary world and interpret the reach solvent code in the binary world what is it actually doing okay so it can correct t error vectors any weight t uh, error vector but the error vector is viewed as viewed as Belonging to GF2 param. Okay, so if I actually view it as a binary error vector, what is the weight that it can correct? Guarantee. It's a gain T. Okay, so that's a bit of a disappointment. It cannot go to empty. It can do some empty, but if you want to guarantee, it can do only T. So if I have T plus one binary errors, I can put them into two plus T plus one symbols and create T plus one symbol errors, which cannot be corrected. Okay, so it can only correct T bit errors. But if you think in terms of bits, what is the block length? It's not n and k. It's what k times m, n times m. Okay, so you you are losing a lot in that. Using a lot of block length to correct just the t. Okay, so there's a subtlety there. But compared to the BCS codes, each element codes will be poor binary codes. Okay, they will not be that good binary codes compared to BCS codes. BCS codes are better, but the each element codes have some huge advantages, which is why they are used. I'll point out these things in the next class. Okay. The next class, I think, is the last class before Shastra, right? After that, we'll meet up. Okay.